attorneys and judges in areas such as family law, personal injury, child support and custody, trademarks, probate, and so much more. Join us every Tuesday at 12 noon on Facebook Live or YouTube Live to get the answers to general legal questions that you may have. And don't forget to subscribe to our new legal YouTube channel at Attorney Tanika Johnson. And for more information about our firm services, visit johnsonlawpractice.com today. Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Legal Hour, where every Tuesday we bring on attorneys, judges, and other legal professionals for them to talk about their areas of expertise. Today, I'm excited to have attorney Beverly McNeil, hello. where we will be talking about social security disability specifically. Attorney McNeil had to school me already. <laughs> A couple times before we came on because this is an area that I am not familiar with. So we all have heard of Social Security, but there is a difference between SSI and SSDI. And I kind of know that, but again, I'm not familiar with it. So I'm excited to bring this information to you. Um, she, I saw a post, someone posted on your page on Facebook last week and was like, Attorney McNeil is the best when it comes to Social Security disability. So check her out. So yes, I'm definitely excited to have this conversation. So also I know it's your birthday month. <laughs> so she she kind of <laughs> cut it. I'm not gonna say she cut it short, but she came yes, um, she after um, some partying for the month. So thank you for joining us. Um, as we get started, before we get started, just let us tell everyone a little bit about yourself, where you're from, where you went to school and how you got into this particular area of social security disability. Well, okay, so myself, um, I always say originally, originally from New Jersey, but I moved to Florida when I was a teenager. So, um, but, you know, living in South Florida, went to law school in Michigan, went to Cooley Law School. And when I graduated, I actually started with family law. I actually didn't know much about social security disability, only through my sister, because I have an older sibling who's autistic, nonverbal who I've seen gone through the social security disability process. And I heard about the area of law from a colleague of mine. And I started learning the area of law and I started with social security disability, I would say 2016. And ever since then, I've, I've been loving it. And I switched from family law to social security disability law and that's where I am now, so. Okay. so. Was that transition easy from family law to social security disability? Because it, I know, you know, family law can be a lot of drama. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of drama. Um, it wasn't easy, I'll admit, financial wise, because with family law cases, you get your money up front, you know, you know, you don't have to wait to when to get paid. Social security disability is contingency. And it's contingency as in I have to win to get paid. It's not a situation where, okay, maybe if the injuries or or the person's disability is not that bad, maybe I could get a little bit. No, it's all or nothing. So financially it wasn't, but as you said, the drama aspect of it, it's there is drama with social security disability, but it's not the same type of drama in family law. And mm -hmm. I, I've always say this, it, it takes a special attorney to practice family law. And it, it, it's not for me. It wasn't for yeah. me. So, yeah. Listen, yeah. You know, I had my hand at it the first couple of years, but I knew I didn't want to go into it. But, um, <laughs> I was like that, that ultimate <laughs> mediator. I'm like, let's just mediate because nobody's going to be happy. <laughs> let's talk it out. I totally get it. So, okay. As far as Social Security, the biggest question or maybe most basic question is what's the difference between Social Security or SSI versus Social Security Disability? Social Security Disability, or, or we'll say Social Security Disability Insurance, that's, that's the disability that you receive from working. That's when you have your paycheck and you, you, know, you see the, you know, FICA, they take out, you know, the taxes and everything. That's Social Security Disability Insurance. So if someone has paid into Social Security a certain amount of years or a certain amount of credits, obviously it varies based on age or whatnot. But if someone becomes, okay, disabled and not able to work anymore, then they could go into that insurance and apply for Social Security Disability Insurance. The thing is, a lot of people feel like, okay, I paid into Social Security Disability all these years. I'm entitled to it. But just like car insurance, 
you know, you don't receive that money unless you get in a car accident, right? You know, I, I don't practice PI. I'm just trying to throw an example. So with social security disability, you have to be proven that you're disabled and then you have, you know, then you receive it. So that's social security disability or SSDI. Now SSI, supplemental um, security income, that's for people who wants to apply for social security disability. However, they don't have enough work credits. They haven't worked enough. They So they haven't paid into the system. So in order to receive that, you of course have to be proven that you're disabled, but also you have to meet the income requirements. So if you're a single person, you can't make no more than $2,000 or have no more than $2,000 of assets. As a married person, no more than $3,000. So that's the difference between the two. And then with SSI, if you qualify for SSI, the payments are usually lower than SSDI. And I believe the cap is about 700 right now, but that's the difference between the two. Okay, so is there a minimum age for either one? Mm, see, for, okay, so minimum age. Adults start at 18 because you do okay. have children cases. I do not handle children's social security disability because just the easiest answer is different, right? Mm -hmm. And also as a child, when you have to apply for social security disability, you're not receiving SSI, it's, social, it's SSDI. The first one is based on your parents' income, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, children don't have a work history or anything. So um, minimum age, it's 18. You would say the adults will start at 18, but there's different factors as well, but usually, you know, it's 18. And then I know you didn't ask this, but the oldest age is usually at the age of retirement. Because a lot of people in, think that, okay, I'm at the age of retirement, but I still want to apply for disability. No, you just have to apply at this stage is just retirement because a lot of people don't realize that. Let's say you are on disability before you reach the age of retirement. Right. Once mm -hmm. you reach that age, it turns into retirement anyway, because it comes from the same, I guess I like to say pool or, you know, same bucket. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. So minimum 18 oldest maximum age of retirement. Okay, so just for clarification, SSDI is for those people who have paid into the system, so yes. to speak. Yeah, um, they've had an employer, and every you know check something goes there. So, would you say that the SSI is more so for people who are self-employed, or again, who no. you know for whatever reason? Okay, low income, low income. Okay, because yes. that's money from the government. Actually, because okay. you didn't pay that money that you receive for SSI is not money that you paid into. So it's money from the government. So okay. I guess sort of a welfare, I guess. And it's based on your income. So, OK. Yeah. Gotcha. OK. So let's talk about the qualifications for being termed or deemed disabled. What is a disability as defined by the Social Security Administration? Disability defined by Social Security Administration is that you have to have a disability or impairment that have caused you not to be able to work 12 months or more, or you have one that it's predicted, obviously, you know, based off of medical records and medical, you know, opinion, professional opinion that you are not going to be able to work for at least 12 months or more. And when we say work, I, I always have to emphasize this. It's not just your past job that you're not able to perform anymore. It's any job that you're not able to perform. And that's why it's hard for people to receive disability. So I was going to say, that sounds like a high bar. It is. Um, so <laughs> it is. meaning, let's say that you were the CEO of a company or an executive at, right. at a company. You were in an accident, let's say. Um, and you can't walk or physically, you're disabled, you can't do anything. But they could technically work at McDonald's. Um, would they qualify just off the top of your head? They they can technically work, but maybe they have something going on where maybe they're not able to perform the CEO or the executive position anymore, but they could work at McDonald's. Is that considered a disability? If they are working if they're able to work at mcdonald's you're saying yeah. even though they yeah. can't 
No, because they're able to work at McDonald's, so they're not considered disabled, if that wow. makes sense. And they're probably, if, not to be technical, but your example said if they're not able to walk, you said, if they get in the car. Yeah, let's walk. say they're not able to walk, or maybe they so have. They mm -hmm. I was going to say they would be able to work at McDonald's because that's a, as we consider light job, standing, whatnot. Okay. So it probably would be a sedentary job, they would say. An example like that, they would probably say, and that's a good example. So you have a person, like you said, worked a CEO job, which we call skill job, right? And they're not able to work that position anymore. Yes, yeah, so security could say, well, this person could do a sedentary job just sitting down, collecting tickets in the parking lot for a concert, for example, right? Mm -hmm. they, will, they will try to name the most simplest job that the claimant could do. So that's why it's our job as social security attorneys is basically try to eliminate all those possibilities that you will try to say that, okay, the client could still do this. And like, okay, they could do a sit down job. However, how long can they really sit, right? How, mm -hmm. what issues are they having sitting? Can they sit for five minutes? Do they have to get up every minute due to the injuries? Now you're off task at work. Yes, they could probably do a sit down job, but how long are they really going to be at work? How long are they going to really pay attention? So that's like our job to do. And that's where it gets, you know, hard, I would say. But, you know, that's what we do. So that's a good example. If we are able to eliminate the fact that they could do even the simplest jobs, then yes, then they're considered disabled. But if they're saying, well, they could do these other jobs, then no, they're still not considered disabled. Even if you have... A, an impairment or have a disability that is proven by your doctors and everything. If it's still proven, if it's still see, if it if it still shows, I'm sorry that you could do the simplest job. Then no, you're not disabled. So, wow, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. So, is there are there income caps and limits to SSDI? No, not SSDI because again, that's based on you know you working. In the system, you pay into the system. So it's technically, like we say, your money if you're disabled. Now, if you're on SSI, there's a lot of rules and stuff. You have to be careful that your SSI won't be taken away. So that's the difference. Because again, SSI is based on your income. You have to have basically be under a certain, you know, a certain income level. So let's say you on SSI only and you have this, you know, this deposit of a, a large amount of money in your account, for example, that could trigger SSI or Social Security, I mean, and they will contact you and see what's going on. And they could probably take um, the amount away. So that's why when it gets to SSI, you have things like special needs trusts and everything that you could look into if you get a, a you know a settlement or get some type of lump sum or something like that, it's good to put into a trust. I don't handle wills and trusts. I you know I have people I refer that to, but yeah. That's what SSI gets more complicated when it comes to the income and you have to be careful. So. Okay. And I just had recently someone asked me um, who was on, who is on SSDI and they were getting basically an inheritance from a, um, a parent that passed. And so they were concerned about, you know, will this take them off or will this, you know, basically reduce their benefits or kick them off their benefits? Um, will something like that, let's say they were going to get like $20,000. Will something like that trigger SSA, Social Security Administration? Yeah. The SSA. <laughs> it's confusing. I know. I know. To, to say, okay, where's this money coming from? You're no longer qualified or is there a break? Do they have to reapply? Like, what is the process? for that situation? Again, it depends if you're on SSDI or SSI. If you're on SSDI, it doesn't matter. It won't trigger it. Now, if you're on SSI, yeah, you have to look into, like I said, just certain trusts that, or special needs trusts that, that I know of that you could try to um, basically get so that it won't trigger your SSI. So it just, it depends if you're on SSDI, SSI. It's only you know, something you have to be careful about if you're on SSI. So. Gotcha. Okay. So do you have to constantly review or renew like every year or when you get it, especially for SSDI, once you get it, do you have it or what's the periodic review? It all, depends, sure 
it all depends on what Social Security has decided. So I'll give you a few examples of recent cases that I've had. So, you know, I've had, you know, a recent case that I've won and that one was, okay, this client, he's disabled. Okay. He's going to receive this amount for the rest until he, rest of his life, until he reached the age of retirement and switched to retirement payments. And that was fine. But then I had another case that I've won. This client is, and they do this usually with younger claimants. Sometimes she was 26 years old and we did win. However, the judge was still, well, I think she's going to get better in a year. So in a year, we're going to re-review this. And that is called continued disability reviews or CDRs. That's what those are called. So it all depends on what the judge, if it's at the hearing level, decide, or, you know, if it's at the initial reconsideration level, which is the lower level is what Social Security decide. Sometimes they say we have to re-review in three years. It all depends on each individual's, you know, you know, disability, basically. And if it's something that Social Security believes that will get better. So. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as far as, again, I think you touched on it briefly, but just for clarification, what does it cost to retain you as an attorney um, for SSDI case? It doesn't cost anything. It's, well, not anything out of your pocket. The way that Social Security Disability get sorry, the Social Security Disability Attorneys, the way we are receive payment is that if the claimant, if we win their case, it could you know be at any level. But if we win, that's when the attorney gets paid. We get paid 25% of the past due benefits of our client. Past due, the past due benefits or the back pay is basically the amount of money that they have accrued from the first time they have applied to the time they actually finally receive a favorable decision. So let's say an individual applied on I'm just January 1st, year 2000, right? Initial application that was denied. They did an appeal for request for consideration, denied. And now we're at the hearing level. The hearing is December 2020, right? We win at December 2020. We win, you know, client wins. So after the client wins, then you know, the, the case is sent to the payment center. They process the payments and everything. And basically, they'll process how much the client will receive monthly. But they will also receive a back pay from January 1st, 2020, to December 2020, because they've been waiting all that time, right, for the decision. So that's like their back pay or past due benefits from when they were waiting. The government would pay us 25% of that back pay. And that's how we're paid. And there's a cap. The cap was... Well, it's still six thousand, but it's been raised to seven thousand two hundred starting in November. So that's how we get paid. Okay. So it's twenty five percent, but no more than the cap. And yeah, so with a lot of, and I'm glad you asked that question because I still get the question of, well, how much do I owe you? How much do I, how much I owe you for this case? It's like you don't have to pay anything. It's just we're gonna work together to win, right? We're gonna get these benefits. So yeah. So. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, most people think anything that is government related, that it's going to take a very long time. And so the example that you gave is, is like an was, was about a year. But how long, let's say you have a case that goes to the highest level before an administrative law judge. Um, what is the process like time wise? How long does it usually take if we're going to the highest level? Um, the highest level technically is the federal the um actual federal court but i don't handle the cases okay. at the federal court level but usually as you said highest level is a ministry law judge right that's where mm -hmm. people usually stop if they don't get decision that they want you could also appeal this i know there's a lot of but that's i could you know talk about that in the next question um it could be two years um one year two years i've seen three it takes a long time I've always say, when they ask me, how long would it take for this? How long would it take for that? I would say it's the government. And unfortunately, I cannot give you an answer. I usually say, if you think it takes three months, then double that because that's how long it's going to take. Because if I give them a number, they're going to, you know, my client's going to keep asking. So what happened? What's wrong? What's wrong? I'm always upfront with them and tell them, listen, it's the government. It's going to take forever. Yeah. But I always say, as soon as I hear something, I will let you know. And that's what I usually do. But unfortunately, yes, things take a long time. Even after we win a case, 
and we're waiting for our money. That takes a long time. <laughs> so everything. <laughs> okay, okay, let's say, okay, you get a favorable decision. Yeah. And they're like, okay, we're going to pay this back pay. You have an attorney. Well, how long does that usually take before the decision to you getting paid and your client getting paid? Well, average, because I know some social security attorneys, unfortunately, that are still waiting for like payments from like a year or so, because that happens as well. But in my experience, average, a month or two after the favorable decision, sometimes three, it all depends. And then, and it all depends on calculating the, if the claimant have kids, because sometimes they have to calculate that and everything. I have realized I receive my back payment first and then the client will receive. Like I'll give you an example, because only because it's one of the recent ones. I had a hearing in May. No, I had a hearing in April. We, I found out that we won in May. I didn't get paid for that case till July. And she just told me she got paid probably last week. She finally told me she got paid. And that's mm -hmm. actually quick, <laughs> to be mm -hmm. honest with you. So, yeah. I can just imagine just throughout the process, it's taking years for you to get benefits. Just how financially draining and, and burdensome it can be for the client. Do you have exactly. any resources that you give to your clients? Like, like, what do they do in the interim? I mean, if they're winning... I'm thinking, you know, they can't work. And so just financially, like what resources do you do you give? I mean, that, that you can. Unfortunately, there's not really a lot of resources that we can give. You know, again, like we said, it's the government. The, the thing you could do, you could say, you know, this this case is a, um, you know, a type of case that needs to be expedited. Right. Or sometimes we could su submit what we call dire need letters where clients are homeless and they need to hurry with decisions. But so, unfortunately, Social Security still do not move fast enough. They don't. So, mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I have all types of clients, like you said, the CEO that work the high paying job. And then unfortunately, because they work so much, they work themselves to get sick and now they're disabled and they're not making that money anymore. And now they're struggling with their mortgage and everything. Or I have the client that never really worked and They've been living with friends and stuff. And I have clients that technically are homeless. So, mm -hmm. you know, I just try to tell them about resources and depending on the state that they're, they're in, because, you know, every state is different when it comes to different type of resources. So I try to provide them with that. But unfortunately, there's not you know much that we can do. And my heart breaks for a lot of my clients that deal with that because it's, you know, I'm not here to bash the Social Security Administration. I'm not. Right. But sometimes I just feel like I wish they could do a little better, especially with the clients that are just suffering while they're waiting. So, yeah, that's a long time. Yeah. Um, and so I guess I'm thinking, you know, worst case scenario is maybe I, they used to say welfare. I don't know if it's still welfare, like TANF and food stamps, that kind of thing. And I'm assuming that goes a little bit quicker. Um, you can kind of get those benefits, but it's not. A long term right. solution, but yeah, that's that's heartbreaking. Um, if you are joining us live, you have any questions, be sure to put it in the chat, and I will ask um, Attorney McNeil. I do have Stephanie, who is one of my really, really good friends. Thank you for hi, joining us. Uh, she said hi, good information. <laughs> Daryl Spears, yes, good information sharing with my community. So, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. So. Um, for people who may not know this, and I kind of knew this because I did represent mental health patients okay. for about 10 years. Awesome. And, you know, one of the questions that the judge would ask me in the hearing income, do you have SSDI, that kind of thing. So okay. just, you know, kind of want to talk about that from your perspective, the ability to qualify for SSDI, having a mental health mm -hmm. diagnosis and that kind of thing. Because I think a lot of people think it's all just physical ailments or impairments. No, it's not just physical impairments. No, it's also mental. Um, um, I'll give you an example. Like I, I have a lot of also because what vets, you know, you could apply for a veterans disability, and then after they receive their veterans disability benefits, they come and apply for social security disability. Most of their impairments are mental, PTSD, um, depression, anxiety, and it's harder, of course, to prove that based just on mental impairments. There's people who apply based on both. People apply physical alone. People apply mental alone. When it's mental alone, the thing with that is um, 
there are a lot of people who are working with depression and anxiety because it's controlled, right? Mm -hmm. And some people are working with PTSD. So it's a matter of showing how severe their situation is. How often are they going to a psychologist? Do they have a psychiatrist? You know, and then with Social Security, they not saying I I I believe therapists, certified therapists are just as good as psychologists, but they like to see psychologist notes, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. And their mind is like, oh, it's more severe if they go into psychology, if they go into doctor So It's more severe if the psychiatrist is giving them the medicine. It's more severe if they're going to, if they're talking to someone a few times a week as opposed to once a month. Hospital visits, you know? Um, in Florida, it's called being Baker Act. That if they, you know, try to, you know, basically harm themselves plenty of times, then they have hospital visits. There's a lot of factors they look at. And also, you know, by the time I get to a hearing based off a case that have mental impairments, I like to have at least two years of records based on the mental impairments because that's what they want to see. It's it's a little mm -hmm. harder. It is. But yes, you definitely could apply based on mental impairments as well. Definitely. Okay, so just being, let's just say you have, you were committed involuntarily um, for a, a mental episode or what have you, does that not automatically trigger or qualify you for SSDI? No. You did, you did just mention two years. So I'm thinking if it's, you know, a lot of times it's the first time a right. person that has been diagnosed or they've been committed um, to a facility involuntarily. It and doesn't. So that, automatically trigger it no it helps with the case okay. but no it doesn't automate yeah it doesn't and so you're still looking at a couple years um records and and then after that the process i guess <laughs> so um, you, i mean you could be looking at a long period of time wow. and, and then also it depends on and i'm basing my answers off the hearing when i have these hearings it depends on the judge too a lot of these factors depends on who you are in front of as well. Um, Cause you could have a judge that will look at those same records and say, yeah, I could tell that, you know, this person has been dealing with severe impairments, you know, through this, this time. And, you know, and that means they will continue to deal with this. Or you could have a judge that has said, and this happened to me before too. Well, so-and-so was working this whole time with the mental you know, impairment. So I don't understand why they're, why they still can't work. So it all depends on the judge as well. So, but um, it doesn't automatically trigger to say, okay, now you're disabled. No, it just helps. It's just part mm -hmm. of the factors that will help eliminate again any possibility of saying that this individual could perform the most simplest job, most unskilled, simplest job. That's what you have to eliminate. So. Now, okay. also, there's also other exceptions when it comes to age, once an individual is 50 over or 55, but it gets kind of complicated. But I always explain that to my clients who are around that age as well. It gets a little easier. So Okay. We'll yeah. explain that process. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're here for it. Come on. Over 50, what, what, what do we have going on? <laughs> What's the benefit of turning 50? <laughs> well, <laughs> this was AARP. <laughs> right? I'm going to have to apply soon, you know. <laughs> Okay, oh, yes, 50. <laughs> so when individuals turn 50, right? Okay, now let's I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of a client that is 50 that comes to me, then or a client that comes who's 55. So mm -hmm. they once they turn 50, there's another set of rule that applies. We call it the grit rules because that's our you know sling for it, but it's the medical vocational grid. Grid rules, and I should know the proper name for it right now, and I don't. But we used to, you know, we're so used to saying the grid rules. Um, basically, if a client is 50 and comes to me, right, and they have a job working McDonald's, let's use that example, right? They were a cashier. And if they weren't 50 years old, if they was 48, they're injured. They can't work at McDonald's anymore. But they could do a sit-down job. 48, 47, if... The judge says, or Social Security says, this person could go do a sit-down job. They're not disabled, and they're going to go do a sit-down job. But once, if a client is 50, right, and their past job was working at McDonald's, they were cashier, now they hurt. Judge or Social Security says, they can only do a sit-down job. Well, because the person is now entering a older age, starting at 50, the grid rules apply. Because now... 
they're saying, okay, if it's proven, of course, first that the client is not is, is disabled or haven't been able, haven't been working, you know, have not been working, have a severe impairment, and it's proven they can't do their past job anymore. If they can only do a sit, if they could do a sit down job, they will still be found disabled at age fifty to fifty five. So usually with those clients, I say to myself, okay, I just need to prove that they could do a sit down job and they'll get it because their mindset is at the age 50, it's going to be harder for you to find another job now. So let's make it easier for you guys, right? Mm -hmm. That's between the age 50 to 55. Now a client hits that other magic number 55, it gets even a little easier because 55, come to me, past job working at McDonald's as a cashier. That's what we call a light position and you're standing up. And again, it's proven they cannot perform that position anymore. And now age 55 and up, I don't even have to prove that my client could only do a sit down job. I could just prove they could do a light job and they will get it. Because now you're entering another age bracket, 55. Oh, now it's really going to be hard for you to right? To find another position. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's other nuances and other stuff, but that's like the most basic way I could explain it. So, you know, that's why I always ask for ages, of course, you know, and I always say, if you're under 50, it is harder to receive it. That's why sometimes mm -hmm. clients are like 47, 48, and they have denied or even 49. I always say, you know what? Start over again. You're about to turn 50. It's going to be easier. Or if they close to 55, if you if if you want to start over again, I will wait till you turn 55, right? Because like I always say this, social security is a game and you just gotta know the game. So mm -hmm. so that's the 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 nuances with the, the age differences. Okay, so you bring that up. Okay, let's say someone came in at 48 and you're like, well, or they turn 49. Mm -hmm. Are you saying it's better to wait until you turn 50 and start all over as opposed no. to pursuing this? particular let's say they already applied they got denied you know should they just go through the appeal process or should it. they stop was... and, and start at 50 okay. i'm saying if they've been denied and their date you know they went all the way to the top and they come to, and they already been denied fully but they already start the process no i always say keep going because you never know so no i i'm not not like that i'm just Okay. To be more clear, it's more so individuals who haven't started the process. They probably applied before in the past, been denied, and they, you know, they in a situation where they're not, you know, they even though they're not working, you know, they're, you know, if it's a, you know, if they're married or whatnot, their spouse is working, so financially they're not struggling. They just want to try again to apply because they know they can't work. So if a situation like that, that's what I'm talking about. But if they come to me and they already have been denied, yeah, we keep going. Because I also mm -hmm. could argue that this individual is close to the age of 50, you know, closely approaching that advanced age. That's another thing I could argue. So, so yeah, no, yeah. Okay, so then is it at 62, that's when it transfers over to just Whatever the, the age, full, that's early retirement age, 62, okay. full, the full age of retirement, which I know it depends the year you were born. So mm -hmm. it's very 66, right? Seven. I know I should know it, but but yeah, it's the full age of retirement. Yeah. Okay. So full retirement. I was thinking, I think we thought it was 67, but I don't know. I don't say that with authority. I'm just not what I remember. I know, <laughs> they, I know most people don't know they take early retirement. They take it at 62. Right. Early retirement. Is they never make right. it to 67 anyway. <laughs> Everyone that I know. So, okay. <laughs> so we talked about the process. Just talk about, just a little bit more about the entire process from application to if it does go to like the federal level. Okay. All right. So um, basically social security has three levels that are before the federal um, government, not federal government, sorry, federal district, if you take it that far, but you have the initial level, then you have request for consideration and hearing level, the hearing level. So if you apply for social security disability, you apply initially um, the application could be done online. Um, now that everything is opening up again due to COVID, applicants could go in in person. I believe, though, because of the you know COVID rules, I believe you know these certain places you really need to make an appointment before you go, whatnot. So you do the application, you file. At this level, you have someone from Social Security, you know, making a decision. 
and unfortunately, 70% of those applications are denied anyway, right? Did you say 70? Yes. 70, wow. Mm -hmm. okay. 70% of applicants are denied the initial level. Now, after an individual is denied, of course, Social Security wants you to what? Start over again. But do not start over. The key is to keep going. You have to what we call save your case, right? So after you deny at the initial level, and I like I said, I'm upfront with my clients. If they come to me at initial level, I said most likely they're going to deny you. And usually it happens. There's a few times I've won at the initial level, but of course that's where the disability is really severe. Um, um, certain you know disabilities such as certain cancers or whatnot, they you know, or individuals on dialysis. You know, those are situations where Social Security actually have compassion and, you know, they were approved individual. And, but sometimes they still take forever to make that decision. But that's a different story. But um, so at the initial level, denied, then you appeal what we call request for consideration. They say they say that a different set of eyes are looking at your application to see if the first person have made a mistake. Are your chances of winning are a little higher? Maybe a little bit, a little bit, because I've had cases that were denied initial and we wanted reconsideration, but chances are still low that you would actually win at that level. Because again, they want you to what start over. So now after you're denied at reconsideration, now you now you appeal for the hearing level. Your case moves from the local disability termination offices or social security office to the actual social security hearing offices. At this stage, if you have not had an attorney all this time, please get an attorney at the hearing level. Mm -hmm. Do you need an attorney at the initial reconsideration level? I'll be honest and say, maybe, maybe not. And I'll just be real with that. But you definitely need an attorney at the hearing level. Because at this stage, it's a judge making your decision. Now, you know, it's a judge that's going to be looking at your case. You're going to have medical experts at the hearing, possibly. There's always a vocational expert or AKA job expert at the hearing. And then as the attorney, our job is to, at, at the initial reconsideration level, the first two levels, usually Social Security is um, requesting those records and getting those things for you or whatnot. They, they sometimes don't like when the attorney is involved. I had a little you know, conversations with a few Social Security Administration that had a little attitude with me because they didn't like the fact that I was helping my clients, but I don't care. So, mm -hmm. but at the hearing level, though, we are, we, we're more hands-on. They want us to get the records. They want us to be more involved. That makes sense. And your chances at the hearing level to win are actually 60, 40 to 60% higher than initial reconsideration. So, because you have saved your case, and you did not give up and you kept going, you know, that's, you know, I guess one of the reasons why the chance to hide it at the hearing level, because no one is paying out of pocket to pay an attorney or just to pay to apply. Everyone applies. Mm -hmm. Everyone applies for security disability. There's a backlog. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. So they do this to weed people out, basically. That's what they do. So yeah, they want you to give up. Of course they do, you know, but that's the process. The key is to keep going and don't give up and to save your case. So Yeah. Reminds me of law school, like LSAT was yeah. trying to weed people out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what it is. The initial level is <laughs> L. You know, request for consideration is two L's and hearing level is three L's. You made it. Right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so at the um the, the reconsideration level. Who is, is that an in-person hearing um, no. or virtual or that's just kind of behind the scenes? No hearing. They okay. look over the case and look over the notes. Um, but just keep in mind that at these first two levels, these, you know, I'm, there's some employees that work so security that are great, but some you could tell burned out. Some of them, I I feel like, let's say you have a person applying initially who have a whole bunch of medical records and all this stuff wrong. I, sometimes I feel like they don't even look or pay attention. They just look for certain keywords, right? Mm -hmm. Because if their goal is to deny anyway, that's what they're going to do. So yeah, it's no hearing at the first or consideration level. No, it's just, like you said, behind the scenes and they're going over your paperwork and making that decision. Okay. Um, I know you said it's, you know, up to 60, 50, 67% um, higher chances of a favorable decision at the hearing level. 
Um, how often do you see where cases actually go beyond that to the federal district level? I've, I have seen it. Um, again, I personally don't handle that. If, if I have a client that's like, no, I, you know, after the hearing level. So after the hearing level, just to clarify this, if you are denied, you have a chance to appeal to the appeals council. Right. Okay. Um, with that, basically, the best thing to do is, again, have an attorney to write a brief. And what you're doing is the appeals council is in Fall, Falls Church, Virginia. And what you're doing is not saying that the judge, OK, got it wrong. I am really am disabled or my client's disabled. I am arguing that the way the judge got to that decision is wrong. He left out a few medical providers, for example, or he didn't fully um, articulate his reason for this, or he left out a few um, impairments, you know? So you have that option. They say 10% of cases are remanded back, but you have that option. If you're denied at the appeals council, then you have the option to take it to federal court or you'll just start over again. Or if you win at the appeals council, you have another chance to have another hearing and um, I have situations where I've done that and I want at the second hearing or I tell clients our second chance, you know, so um, federal district, like I don't handle it, but I have seen it done and, and it happens. So okay. Not federal government, I'm sorry, federal district court. So, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's, that's good information. Um, so yeah. I want to know, like, as far as your clientele, like, what's the percentage of SSI clients versus SSDI clients. I have you more, handle both, correct? I handle both, but I have more SSDI clients. I have a lot more. Um, I do have a few, I have a few vets, and usually the vets that come to me, they already are receiving veterans' disability. So they won't qualify for SSI anyway, because they're way over the income thing. So yeah, um, mostly SSDI. Um, and of course we of course, anybody would prefer more SSDI clients because they're going to pay more and more of a possibility of a more of a back pay for us. But I, yes, I personally, I handle both. So, but I do see more SSDI clients. Okay. And so I think another question people want to know, I'm in Georgia, you're in Florida, you have people in Texas or Connecticut. Um, can you help all those people or, you, or can you only help people in uh, residents of Florida? I help people all through the U.S. because I'm mostly, my firm is also virtual, 100% virtual. So when a client comes to me and say, you know, I prefer an attorney that I want to go in the office and talk to, that is absolutely fine. And I discuss with them and say, you know what, I may not be the attorney for you. And sometimes they say, well, I don't care. I still want you as my attorney. Or they, they'll say, yeah, you're right. You're not the attorney for me. And I'll gladly refer them. Because I have, you know, I know a few local social security, all the attorneys here that I'll probably refer to, or I'll give them a social security attorney referral number. But yes, I have clients, it's funny you said Texas, I have clients in Texas, I have, you know, clients in Mississippi, Colorado, California, Georgia, New York, I handle all through the U.S. Because of, you know, COVID again, prior to COVID, all hearings were in person, Right. COVID bought on the phone and video option. And it looks like those options are here to stay because there are a lot of clients who do not want to leave the house for a hearing. They're right. sick. Why would they want to go leave for a hearing? So usually the clients that I have, they're like, oh, no, attorney McNeil, I'm fine. I, I want to be right in my house. I am good with the phone hearing or I'm good with a video hearing. We are good. So that's how I handle everything, you know, everything electronically. And then if they want to, you know, have a video chat and talk. I, I'll be happy to do that. So, even though I'm virtual, I'm not far away. You know, like I always say, mm -hmm. when you become a client at McNeil Firm, you become family. So, even mm -hmm. though I'm virtual, I still talk and and try to update you on everything. You know, you know, text, call me, whatnot, so we could get the process going and help receive these benefits. So, yes, it doesn't matter what state you're in because it is federal law. So it's the same in every state. So. Okay. And so I know you don't charge a, a fee necessarily. You get your fee um, from a favorable case decision. Is there a fee for a consultation? No, ma'am. No. no. We don't charge for consultations either. So since okay. it's all contingency, yeah. Okay. That's mm -hmm. awesome.
Yeah. Is there anything that I'm missing, like any case or common cases that I'm missing or any final words as we wrap this up? Um, I think I, because I was trying to think of like certain questions that I get a lot. So I did, we talked about the payment. So to clarify, there's, you know, there's no money up front. You're not, there's no fees unless we win. Um, mostly is, it's not just your past job. I always have to emphasize that because I get, well, I can't do my job as construction work anymore. I can't do my job doing it. I said, I understand that, but they're going to name all these other jobs that they have. And another thing, they base their jobs on this book called Department of Titles, which is the DOT. They haven't updated that book since the 90s. Mm. I don't know if they're not updating it because they want to keep on denying people to receive disability. I'm not sure, but they will name jobs that my clients could do that I'm thinking, where? <laughs> Who's like, still- like what? Give me an example. Like, I, I haven't heard this in a while, but when I was hearing... Um, like a silverware wrapper, you know, like stuff like that, or a job as a document. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Silver, silverware, wrapper. silverware wrapper. Yes, oh, that's a profession that they have in this 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 big <laughs> book. I'm not gonna say little book because I know it's big. So <laughs> that's just like, we're, huh? They, we when did they do that? When did they do that in the '90s? <laughs> Maybe 60s and 70s. Right. right. <laughs> so um, that's another issue, too. So it's, I, always, I always have to emphasize to my clients that they will still try to name other jobs. So keep that in mind. And I, and I understand why, because I don't handle workers comp, but I understand what workers comp. And I also think with long term, short term disability, which is different from social security disability. That's another thing I need to emphasize. I do not handle short term or long term disability. Um, I believe with those, it's depend on your past job. But I always have to emphasize with social security disability, it's any job. It's not just your past job. So those are the things that are really important that I, I want people to remember, which is, again, why it's hard to receive social security disability. So It sounds like, well, I thank you so much for just even having the passion to yeah. assist your clients because you definitely have to have a pipeline for you to do this. Right, yeah. while you were trans transitioning, because it is a long process. So I definitely yeah. thank you for you know sticking with it, because we need more attorneys that will do that. So again, just to kind of reiterate, I, I'm assuming you can kind of do the initial application yourself. Well, if you want to. well okay. yeah, okay. They could come to me if they haven't applied before either. They can, but of course, preference is clients who's been already been denied and want to to appeal, but yeah, I still have clients that come to me who haven't applied and I help them with the initial process too. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So I have Attorney McNeil's website at the bottom, which is the McNeil. Oh, I put I put it wrong. It should be firm. The McNeil firm. I have friends. Yeah, right. That's it. The McNeil firm. No. no, I yeah. have friends. It's, it's, it's oh, oh, you put fr oh, oh, firm. It's firm, people. It's firm. That's my RM, guys. <laughs> but, but the um the correct uh, <laughs> website is actually in the comments. So if you view the comments, your, your information is there as well. We'll be keeping, keeping those in the notes of the show. Thank you so much for coming on. That was You're really informative for me. me. And I think even for other attorneys, this is yeah. really good. And just everyone or anyone who's, you know, um has to go through the process. At least yeah. they know. And yeah. they were saying, there. So again, thank you so much. Be sure to check Attorney McNeil out at the website and join us next week. If you are a business owner, small business, we will be talking about trademarks with Attorney Soaps and protecting your brand, which we need to do as solo attorneys or any other business. That's true. Um, so be sure to check it out next week, Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern, and we will see you next time. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you for having me. Of course. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.